Welcome to the Shuv Show. Come and let us return to the Lord. Is studying scripture all Greek to you? Maybe it's because you're thinking like a Greek. Time to swap that linear mindset of check boxes and vanishing points and start understanding life like a biblical Hebrew. Concrete, physical action, and cyclical. What has been will be again. Time to walk as Yeshua walked, the Derech HaKodesh, the way of holiness. Time to shuv, to return to the Father's house and his ways. This is the Shuv Show. He shall come to us as Welcome to the Shuv Show. This is Christine Jackman. I'm your host. And today I'd like to talk with you about something that I wrote last summer, like in July of 2014. And it's called Quiet on the Wrong Day. This past Sunday morning, I walked out onto the deck, the morning sun warm on the planks beneath my bare feet. Absent were the normal workday sounds, no roar of traffic, no loud mechanical buzzing of weed whackers, saws, or lawnmowers. Only peaceful sounds filled the air. Birds, soft breezes, stirring leaves, and the splashing of waterfowl. This first day of the week, the community was at rest. But there was a problem with the picture from my deck in this conservative Christian town this Sunday morning. It's quiet on the wrong day. They had missed their appointment with God by a day. And the sad thing is that most don't even know it. They're missing out on a wonderful heritage and blessing from the Lord given to mankind from creation. For most of my life, I had accepted the spurious reasons given for not obeying the commandment of our Creator to set the seventh day apart as holy. Chosen blindness to the clear instruction, or Torah, of God had robbed me of this blessing and the opportunity to keep the terms of the covenant of our God. Somewhere along the line, someone said, Did God really say? And the rest is history. But yes, Virginia, God really did say, and I quote, On the seventh day God finished his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because he rested in it from all his work from which he had created and made. Genesis Bereshit 2, 2-3. The Hebrew word used here for holy is kadash, meaning basically to be set apart. This is the first occurrence of this word in scripture, and it's used in reference to the Shabbat, or the Sabbath. Yes, you can worship the one true God, the God of Abram, Isaac, and Israel, any day. We should daily live our lives in a worshipful attitude of Godward praise, but that in no way does away with the command to keep the Sabbath on the seventh day. God has expressed himself very clearly in his word. We are without excuse. This is his creation his rules, his time. After all, he is the great king. Does he not have that right? There are those who say that the death and resurrection of Yeshua, Jesus, canceled the commandment to keep the seventh day Sabbath. By this statement, they betray at least two things. One, that they do not understand the true nature of biblical covenant. And two, that they do not realize that they have just disqualified Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, from being the Messiah, they have made him a lawbreaker. Ancient Near Eastern Covenant is forever and binding, a very, very serious thing. You must drop your Greek Western mindset and think like a Hebrew. Hebrew is kind of opposite of Greek thought. Whereas Greek is abstract, Hebrew is concrete, earthy. Biblically Hebraic thought is, life moves in cycles, what has been will be again, there is nothing new under the sun. God has told us, quote, the end from the beginning, end quote. Prophecy can have multiple or even progressive fulfillment. Covenant is deadly serious and forever. The original covenant is never made invalid by its later layers. It can be reaffirmed, renewed with a new generation, but the intent of the original is never, ever violated or tossed out. Study covenant and you'll see. Covenant was and is binding forever deadly serious and not to be entered into lightly. Scripture informs us that God ordained that the Sabbath rest day was to forever be on the seventh day, Saturday, beginning at sundown on sixth day, Friday. 
an ending at the next sundown, a perpetual covenant. Why does it start at sundown? Well, because the biblical day begins at sundown. Remember the creation account, quote, and there was evening and morning the third day. So a day begins at evening. So what does the language of the original covenant say when it was renewed at Mount Sinai after coming out of Egypt? The weekly Sabbath is on the seventh day and not on the first day, Sunday. Quote, this is from Exodus 31, starting with verse 13. Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Most assuredly you shall keep my Shabbatot, my Sabbaths. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you, sets you apart. You shall keep the Shabbat, therefore, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days work is to be done, but the seventh day is a Shabbat of solemn rest, holy to Adonai. Whoever does any work on the day of Shabbat shall surely be put to death. Therefore the children of Israel shall keep the Shabbat, to observe the Shabbat throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. He gave to Moshe when he finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai the two tablets of the testimony, stone tablets written with the finger of God. End quote. So, what part of sign between you and me, throughout your generations, forever, or perpetual covenant, do we not understand? If you are a believer, a follower of Yeshua the Messiah, then by his blood you are grafted into believing Israel. The so-called church does not replace Israel. We join Israel, expand her, cleaving to the God of Israel and his covenant, because in Abraham, all nations will be blessed. Together we are the remnant with circumcised hearts. In every generation God reserves himself a remnant who have not, quote, bowed the knee to Baal. You can see that in 1 Kings 19 and Romans 11.4. Constantly he is working his plan to bring things back full circle, redeeming us back into restored covenant relationship. Ultimately, back to a Garden of Eden type of existence, where we will live in His presence, where righteousness is the rule of the land, the new heaven and the new earth, renovated this time by fire, not water. Salvation is by the grace of God, not by works. And the law, quote unquote, was never given as a salvation document. The Torah, which means instruction, teaching, often translated law. The Torah, found in Genesis or Deuteronomy, was given for the lifestyle of the redeemed community. Let me repeat that again. The Torah, found in Genesis or Deuteronomy, was given for the lifestyle of the redeemed community. It grieves my heart when I hear people say, there is no grace in the Old Testament. To the contrary, Genesis through Revelation, it has always been about grace and a circumcised heart. Remember the Israelites were given the renewal of the commandments at Mount Sinai after they were redeemed out of Egypt. Repentance and redemption, then lifestyle. That's the holy pattern. That bears repeating. Repentance and redemption, then lifestyle change. That's the holy pattern. Let's talk about repentance and redemption. By putting the blood of the Pesach, the Passover lamb, on the doorpost and lintel, that's threshold covenant, by the way, they were saying to the God of Israel, in effect, we repent and reject the gods of Egypt and wish to come back into renewed covenant with the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. By putting the blood of the lamb on the doorpost and the lintels of your heart, you say to the God of Israel, in effect, I reject the gods of this world. I recognize that I have broken your commandments. Please pass over the threshold and come into the house, into covenant relationship with me. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, the God of Israel. Okay, 
Let's look at the lifestyle of the redeemed community. So what about the commandments, or in Hebrew, mitzvot? They are the terms of the covenant, the lifestyle of the redeemed community. These 613 plus mitzvot that we see in the foundational scriptures of Genesis through Deuteronomy are the stipulations or the terms of the covenant. Blood covenant is until death. That means that the covenants that God enters into are forever. Why? Because he lives forever. The Ten Commandments, by the way, literally translated is really the Ten Words. The Hebrew word here is devarim, meaning words, declarations, statements. The Ten function as categories that all 613 plus fall under. Yeshua the Messiah summarized them down further into just two. Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. What this means is that all the commandments are the Torah or instructions of our God for the lifestyle of the set-apart, holy, redeemed community. It's about covenant and how God views covenant. It's about our duty to obey our great king's terms of that covenant. They were given for our good and they are doable, not too hard. Moses told us that and John in the Berich HaRashah reiterates that. Moshe, Moses said in Deuteronomy 30, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. If you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law, Torah, and if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, for this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. It's not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend into heaven and bring it to us that we may hear into it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you shall say, Who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear and do it? No, the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. In the Brich HaRashah, the Renewed Covenant, Yohanan says in 1 John 5, By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his mitzvot, his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his mitzvot, and his mitzvot are not grievous or burdensome. So today, when we fail, we repent and trust in the blood of Messiah's free will offering to cover us and atone for us. How does the Bible understand the word faith? Let's talk about the concept of the word faith. Faith to the writers of Genesis through Revelation was not the Greek concept of faith, but the Hebraic understanding. In, with Greek, Western Roman type of mindset, faith is generally abstract, ethereal, lodged mainly in the brain the heart. It's a thought, it's a feeling. But in Hebrew, Hebrew is all about the verb. It's all about the do. Faith is all about the do. Faith always has an action attached. Faith has feet. It's never mere mental assent, never. Physical and spiritual go hand in hand. Faith and faithfulness are interchangeable terms. You can't have one without the other. Your faith is proved by your actions. First comes repentance and redemption. And then the wilderness, where your faithfulness is proved through testings. Will you stand firm, or will you grumble when you reach the bitter waters in the wilderness? And what is the new covenant, anyway? Read Jeremiah 31. It outlines the new covenant. Remember, the original covenant is never tossed out. So what's new? First of all, notice that the new covenant is not made with Gentile nations, but with house of Israel and house of Judah, which will one day become one stick in Messiah's hand to its fullness. Contrary to the Torah or the law of Moses being regarded as largely irrelevant for today, as many claim, instead, please note, Scripture says that the law, Torah, is written on the flesh heart, and that the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit or Spirit of Holiness, enables us to desire to obey them and empowers us to walk in them. Gentiles are grafted into this covenant as a wild branch. The children of Israel are the natural branches and are grafted back into the covenant given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Israel. Let's look at Jeremiah 31, starting with verse 30. 
Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was their master, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my Torah in their inward parts and write it on their heart and will be their God and they will be my people. And they will no more teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will no longer remember their sin. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for a light by night, which divides the sea when its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if the heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth explored below, then I also will cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, says the Lord. End quote. There are those who say that God has set Israel aside forever due to their sin. Uh, see above, see what we just read. They are calling God a liar, a covenant breaker. Do you really want to poke that bear? Some say the Apostle Paul, or Shaul, taught that we no longer have to walk in most of the terms of the covenant, the 613 plus mitzvot. Well, just what is an apostle? One who is sent by his master with his authority to share the master's message. And what was Messiah Yeshua's message? Salvation is through him. He's the door, the way back into the Father's house. And Yeshua walked in the written Torah. After all, he is the living word. He kept the law, the Torah, the written Torah, all of it. So if you say that Paul taught that we no longer have to obey much of that law that Yeshua walked in, then you have just called Paul a false apostle. Either Shaul was a false apostle, or Yeshua was a false law-breaking Messiah. Or you have misinterpreted Paul. Guess what? Yeshua is not a lawbreaker, and you have misinterpreted Paul. To properly interpret Paul, you must know the Hebraic culture, the history, the mindset of the writer, keep it within the context of the entire epistle, with an eye towards preserving the intent of the entire Word of God, and have a proper understanding of biblical covenant. Paul was a brilliant man and was already being misinterpreted in the first century. Quote, and consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Shaul, Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things. Now get this, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. 2 Peter 3, 15-17 Who are these untaught, unstable people? They twist the scriptures. They're untaught. That means they're untaught in Torah. Just think and remember, what books of the Bible did they have back then? They had Genesis through Malachi, or Genesis through Second Chronicles in the Hebrew Scriptures. Conclusion If you are quiet on the wrong day, please consider seeking the Lord on this matter. If you search for Him with all your heart, you will find Him. Genesis through Deuteronomy. Read it. All Scripture is Torah. And Genesis through Deuteronomy are the foundational Scriptures which contain the heart of God, points to Messiah, and reveals how we are to live. We're talking about covenant here, people, and this is very, very serious. It's time to shuv, to turn, to repent, to return to the Father's house and His ways, the ways that Messiah and His first Talmudim, the disciples, walked out as the redeemed community. Hear this. Shabbat, or Sabbath on the seventh day, 
the Moedim, appointed times or feasts of the Lord, the biblical kosher laws, purity, etc. They remain the lifestyle of the redeemed, set-apart community. We were and still are meant to be a light to the world, to call them back to the good ways of our Creator. Remember Noah? Noah was a preacher of righteousness, but only eight people listened and were saved. Then what that tells me? That tells me that the majority belief doesn't necessarily mean the truth. Listen to this prophetic text yet to be fulfilled. Isaiah 66, 23. And it shall come to pass that from one Rosh Kodesh, new moon, to another, and from one Shabbat, Sabbath, to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Do your due diligence. Search the scriptures, Genesis through Revelation. You will not find one clear command by God moving the sanctity of the Shabbat to the first day or Sunday. The evidence you will find, however, is that Yeshua kept the Sabbath day and the seventh day. He kept the feast. He kept the written Torah, the law of Moses. And so did his Talmudim, disciples, before and after the resurrection. We are to walk as our Messiah walked. Nahon? Right? We are to imitate Him, not denominations. Do you seriously think you'll get a pat on the back from the Lord by tossing out most of His commandments? By tossing them behind your back, chowing into a ham sandwich, ignoring His appointed times, look up Leviticus 23, or by showing up a day late for your weekly appointment with Him? Our Creator says what He means and means what He says. Hear what God says, Isaiah 65, various verses. God says, I have stretched out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good according to their own thoughts, a people who provoke me to anger continually to my face, who sacrifice in gardens, and burn incense on altars of brick, who sit among the graves and spend the night in the tombs, who eat swine's flesh and the broth of abominable things is in their vessels. But you are those who forsake the Lord, who forget my holy mountain, who prepare a table for Gad, and who furnish a drink offering for many. Therefore, I will number you for the sword and you shall all fall down to the slaughter. Because when I called, you did not answer. When I spoke, you did not hear, but did evil before my eyes, and chose that in which I do not delight. Woe, strong words, but needful words to hear. By the way, Yeshua healing people on the Sabbath is not a commentary on Him saying He is doing away with the Sabbath day observed since creation. Nor does it give you the license to do anything that you determine is good on the Sabbath day, even though it includes buying and selling. Do you love God? Really love Him? Then stop looking for loopholes and arguments from silence to assage your conscience because you want to do something on the Sabbath contrary to the commandment. Love doesn't look for a loophole. Honoring God comes first. Then you will know how to love your neighbor. Note, if someone is in life-threatening danger or sickness, mercy trumps the don't work on the Sabbath, don't do business on the Sabbath. Obviously, we need doctors, nurses, emergency workers, police, soldiers. You know, the donkey falls in the ditch, taking him out. Yeshua healing and delivering on the Sabbath demonstrated the true meaning of the Shabbat wholeness, wellness, peace. Sabbath is a type and shadow of the new heaven and new earth to come, where righteousness dwells. 2 Peter 3 When Yeshua healed and set people free on the Shabbat, He was fulfilling His anointing. Luke 4 He, Yeshua, came to Nazareth, where He had been brought up. He entered, as was His custom, into the synagogue on the day of the Shabbat, and stood up to read. The book of the prophet Yeshayahu was handed to him. 
he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim release to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to deliver those who are crushed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He closed the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to tell them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled, or filled full, in your hearing. End quote. When on the Sabbath he came upon people in need of healing, releasing, delivering, he helped them. He was not breaking the written commandment regarding Shabbat. He was lifting the donkey out of the ditch. He was breaking man-made rules, so they accused him of sin. This certain sect of Pharisees that he was dealing with had many man-made rulings, or takamim, that put fences around the Torah, the law, with the intent of preventing people from getting even close to breaking the written Torah. But these takanot, however well intended, ended up having the effect of being a very heavy burden on the people, even to the point of making them break the written Torah of God in order to keep their man-made rules. This is in Mark 7. Yeshua answered them, Well did Yeshayahu prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching as doctrines the mitzvot, or commandments of men. For you have set aside the mitzvah of God, the commandment of God, and hold tightly to the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups, and you do many other such things, he said to them. Full well do you reject the mitzvah of God, the commandment of God, that you may keep your tradition. For Moshe said, or the law of Moses says, Honor your mother and your father, and he who speaks evil of his father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man tells his father or mother, Whatever profit you might have received from me is korban, that is, say, given to God. Then you no longer allow him to do anything for his father or mother, making void the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many things like this. End quote. People like to bash the Pharisees, but when you condemn them, are you not condemning yourselves? Is it not the pot calling the kettle black? Do you keep Sunday, first day, as if it were the God-ordained Seventh-day Sabbath, and ignore the clear word of God to keep the command to honor the Seventh-day Sabbath as holy? Then you are guilty of putting a tradition of men above the clear command of our Creator. For God did not switch the Sabbath day from the seventh day to the first day. The reality is a council of men did that hundreds of years after Yeshua's resurrection. The first believers kept the Shabbat on the seventh day, Setting aside the Word of God is not a new thing. We have a great weakness in that area. It's a sin thing, a rebellion thing. And remember, Scripture says that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Now, you may want to cling to your man-made tradition. Forsaking the God-ordained Seventh-day Sabbath in favor of a first-day Sunday Sabbath, Takano of men ruling, that's up to you. It's your choice. And your decision will reveal if you are a disciple of your denomination or a disciple of Yeshua of Nazareth, the Messiah. Why is Sabbath so important? Why has the enemy so messed with this important day, with this appointed time of the Lord? According to God's own word, the Sabbath is the first of the holy days. Go read Leviticus 23. Shabbat is important because it's a sign of the covenant. When you keep the Shabbat on the day that God ordained, you are also acknowledging Him as Creator. When the great king schedules an appointment, dare we miss it? Shabbat is a mikra kodesh, a holy convocation, a dress rehearsal for the people of the God of Israel, and that includes the Gentiles grafted in, and it's always been that way. Look at Isaiah 56. Quote, also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and takes hold of my covenant. 
Wow, can't say any clearer than that. Keeping the true Shabbat, the true Sabbath, is about coming home, home to the Father's house and his ways. Isaiah 58, if you turn your foot away from the Shabbat, from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Shabbat a delight, O make, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not by doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. End quote. That was Isaiah 58, 13. Love God. Obey his commandments. Genesis through Revelation. It's about one covenant that began with mankind in the garden, with layers of provision for renewal and restoration after the fall. Remember, he has told us the end from the beginning. What has been will be again. There's nothing new under the sun. Show up on Sunday, and you're a day late for your sacred appointment with our Creator. You've missed it. You have rejected the command of God that you may keep your tradition. And you are missing out on a wonderful blessing. Precious person, why would you want to do that? Please, go research first century history and the scriptures and do it with a heart that truly wants to know Him. He will reveal Himself to you. Be willing to lay aside your pride and your pet theories. It'll hurt, but it'll heal. The blessings and greater intimacy gained with our God is worth every teardrop. I know, because I've been there. Joshua 24, verses 14 and 15. Quote, now therefore fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Remember, that someday, according to Isaiah 66, 23, quote, And it will come to pass that from one Rosh Kodesh, one new moon to another, and from one Shabbat to another, all flesh will come to worship before me, says the Lord. I look forward to what that will be like when everyone is quiet on the right day, obeying God and keeping the Sabbath rest. All his Shabbats, including the Moedim, the appointed times, Leviticus 23, all those Shabbats too, because there are Shabbats within the Feast of the Lord. How peaceful it will be to have a holy day of rest where you can worship the Creator and actually hear the creation. Shabbat Shalom. That wraps it up for this edition of the Shuv Show. Don't forget to visit shuvshow.com, S-H-U-V is in virtue, shuvshow.com for archive shows, details on my music, and the Shuv store. Thank you for listening to the Shuv Show. I'm Christine Jackman, and we'll derosh again. Till then, Shalom Aleichem. Show with Christine Jackman. If you appreciate the music and the work of Christine Jackman, please consider shopping her tent making endeavor. Shoestore.com. Shoe. S H U V is in virtue. Shoestore.com. At Shoestore.com, you'll find the music and videos of Christine Jackman that focus on calling the bride to shoe, to return back to the Father's house and his Derech HaKodesh, the way of holiness. Also available at Shoestore.com. You'll find unique messianic gifts, deep ziot, trendy posters, worship directs by warrior brides, ebooks, and more. Stop back often to see what new products we've added. Thank you for standing behind the messianic creative community. Visit today, shoestore.com. Shoe, S H U V as in virtue, shoestore.com. Tonobaba, thank you.